If you ever go to Frisco Town, mind you stay clear to Shanghai Brown. He'll dope your whiskey night and morn. Tell him then Shanghai is round Cape Horn. Oh, I'm here to baptize all your scurvy looking crew into the ancient order of the deep. Or drown them, I don't care. Once a year, San Francisco celebrates its maritime heritage at the Festival of the Sea on the Hyde Street Pier. Every other day of the year, San Franciscans and visitors from around the world come here to see the collection of historic ships docked at the pier and other fascinating artifacts at the Maritime Museum. individuals take advantage of the lagoon for fishing, swimming, and other aquatic sports, while natives and tourists alike come to the neighborhood to sun, eat, entertain, and be entertained. I'd say that Ghirardelli Square, the Maritime Museum, and the Cannery are three buildings which are the historical and cultural cornerstones of this very special neighborhood. The area now known as Aquatic Park was formerly known as Black Point Cove. It was the site of a small Indian village inhabited about 2,000 years ago, but the residents of this village, known as the Ohlone Indians, abandoned the site shortly before the arrival of European explorers in 1775, and the inlet was little used until the gold rush. A time which saw a massive influx of population to the western shore of the continent and the creation, virtually overnight, of an instant city, San Francisco. Although President Fillmore reserved the land around Black Point Cove for military use in 1850, squatters, overflowing from San Francisco's urban core, began building homes and businesses on its shores. These businesses included San Francisco's first permanent water pumping station, California's first woolen mill, and the first major smelting operation on the Pacific coast. These early businesses, pioneer industries, created the core of what would become San Francisco's first industrial district. The 1880s brought a shift or a change to the Black Point Cove area inasmuch as many of these businesses which had been occupying the shores of the cove for 20 or more years found that the cove was actually too small for their needs. Bulkheads, piers, pilings which had pushed out into the cove and had begun to fill it had given them additional space to build, but as they needed more room, they decided to vacate the cove. The Pioneer Woolen Mills were the first to close, closing not so much because of space limitations, but because of economic pressures brought about by the introduction of cheaper woolen mill goods from the eastern seaboard. From the year 1858, the woolen mills survived a series of near disastrous events. In 1861, a fire destroyed most of the buildings and machinery. 
the owners hired Swiss architect William A. Mosier, whose descendants would have a major impact on the area, to design a new, bigger building of brick. In 1869, the owners successfully resisted an eviction attempt by the military. And in 1880, the mill survived strong anti-Chinese agitation, threatening the majority of their labor force. During the Civil War, the woolen mills prospered due to the help of Chinese labor and government contracts for Union uniforms. But renewed anti-Chinese agitation, plus the loss of government contracts after the war, caused the mills to close in 1889. The building remained empty until 1893 when the sons of Domingo Ghirdelli bought the mills and surrounding lot for their expanding chocolate and spice manufacturing business. The Selby Smelters was the next business to move from the cove. Actually having to move because of space considerations, they relocated to the shores of East Bay and continued in operation until the 1970s. The pioneer water pumping station of the Bensley Water Company, taken over by the Spring Valley Water Company in 1865, remained along with the abandoned buildings and a few smaller structures which had sprung up on the shores of the cove during the Civil War. Many of these small ramshackle buildings perched against the steep 40-foot high sand dune bank of the cove were bathhouses. Many of them had begun in the 1860s at a time when the businesses were booming. These bathhouses flourished until the 1890s when the introduction of large public swimming pools in enclosed spaces, such as Sutro Baths on the city's western shore, brought about a change in the public's bathing characteristics and accordingly the bathhouses at Black Point Cove closed. With the turn of the century, Black Point Co. was the site of one industry and one industry alone, this being the chocolate factories of Domingo Ghirardelli and Sons. By this time, William Mosher II, son of the architect who designed the brick pioneer woolen mills, was hired to design additional buildings for the Ghirardelli factory complex. One by one, buildings were being added, all in brick, with a harmony of style to create a model factory. Additionally, the water pumping station was still in place, but uh, had been joined by additional structures. And these structures were small clubhouses, which had actually been barged or shipped around from other points in San Francisco. These early rowing clubs had hoped that the cove would be set aside. Early planners had urged the development of Black Point Cove as a recreational site in 18... 1966, pioneer landscape architect and urban planner Frederick Law Olmsted had recommended in a report to the city and county of San Francisco that Black Point Cove be set aside and preserved for aquatic sport. Yet these early plans for the recreational use of Black Point Cove did not achieve fruition, particularly in 1906 when the removal of rubble from the devastated core of San Francisco as a result of the earthquake and fire brought tons of debris to the shores, destroying the formerly white sand beach of Black Point Cove. At this time, the lot of the old Selby smelters had been leased by the California Fruit Canners Association. William Mosier II had been contracted to design a new brick warehouse and canning facility. River boats and other baycraft brought fruits and vegetables to the cannery wharf, and canned goods were shipped out by State Belt Railroad. In 1906, Southern Pacific approached the military to extend the State Belt Railroad across the cove and tunnel under Fort Mason. By 1912, a completed railroad trestle cut the rowing clubs completely off from the water. This angered the clubs who had felt that the land should and would be a public site for recreation, and accordingly they began to lobby in the teens to see the development of the aquatic park. Early support came from other civic groups and organizations. Ultimately, governmental support was achieved. And finally, in 1928, the City Fathers of San Francisco erected a sign on the shores of Black Point Cove which stated that this would be the site of the city and county of San Francisco's aquatic park. These plans were realized finally in 1935 when the, the federal government announced that it would build the aquatic park for the city and county of San Francisco. But work lagged, and it was not until 1936 when the WPA moved in in force that Aquatic Park was built. The major portion of the project was a large bathhouse, a multi-level stepped or tiered building of reinforced concrete with its rounded curves, porthole windows, ship rail design uh, with a mast-like structure sticking out of the top. The building almost resembled a beached ocean liner. The architect for the bathhouse was, of course, William Mosher III, grandson of the architect for Pioneer Woolen Mills and son of the architect for Ghiardelli and Sons and the Del Monte Cannery. Many artists were brought in to decorate the interior and exterior. 
Hilary Heiler to design mural paintings inside, Sergeant Johnson for mosaic murals on the outside, and Benny Bufano for sculpture of the marine life, just to name three. Despite the design success of Aquatic Park, the project was marred by serious difficulties. These difficulties created a public controversy which to this day is little discussed in San Francisco. The controversy revolved around cost overruns and the decision to lease much of the bathhouse to private concessionaires. Last minute design changes to accommodate a bar and restaurant such as the glass pantry on the second floor resulted in expensive delays and changes to the structure. The artist protested turning over the building for private use. Benny Mino Bufano, controversial sculptor who worked on the project, also indicated that he would not want his sculptures, which he had intended for public use, placed inside the building. He exclaimed that he would rather have his statues outside to be climbed on by children than to have drunk stumbling over them in the Aquatic Park Casino. On January 22, 1939, the Palace of the Public was dedicated by a lavish ceremony. Thousands of people turned out, marveling over the showers triggered by electric eye, drying rooms equipped with heat lamps, and the dressing room facility for 5,000. Yet the murals and tile mosaics were never completed, and other park projects were never started. Soon after dedication day, most of the sand placed on the beach washed away. The bathing facilities never opened, and the concessionaires refused to pay their rent. Complaints about mismanagement of public funds led to a full-scale investigation, and the concessionaires were evicted. The disappointment of Aquatic Park, as it was closed in 1940, was capped by the realization that the city had not funded another project which would have built a sewer outfall to divert raw sewage which was being dumped into Black Point Cove. In 1941, new sand from the Union Street garage excavation was dumped in front of the empty million-dollar Aquatic Park bathhouse, while park officials reviewed new proposals and plans. Before a decision could be made, however, World War II intervened, and the U.S. Army took over the park. The showers and locker rooms were filled with bunks for enlisted men, and the top floors served as headquarters for the 4th Anti-Aircraft Command. Aquatic Park was again off-limits to the public until 1946. The Aquatic Park bathhouse remained virtually unused after the war until it was turned into a maritime museum in 1951. The museum achieved instant popularity with San Franciscans and would, over the years, evolve and expand beyond the bathhouse walls to include a collection of historic ships docked at the Hyde Street Pier, the acquisition of the Hazlitt Warehouse, and the development of a Victorian park linking the three sites. This dream come true was started so to speak, when this lady was just a twinkle in a small boy's eye. Uh, this ship was, I first encountered, first saw, back in the year 1928 when I was 11 years old, and had come down from my hometown of Petaluma to visit an aunt in Alameda, and uh, looked out her front window and beheld a sight that was apparently burned into my memory, because I can picture it still, the yellow spars of the Alaska Packer fleet two blocks away moored in Oakland Estuary. So this interest in sailing ships led me to a variety of ship graveyards. And finally, through a job at a shipyard during the war, to make a voyage on the Star of Finland. And this fulfilled a dream, and out of it grew a critical contact that led to the establishment of the San Francisco Maritime Museum. After the voyage, Carl enlisted his shipmate's brother, this world editor Scott Newhall, for help against a freeway proposed through the family farm. I read a letter a couple of months later to me in Petaluma inquiring how the freeway fight was going, and this led me to write him a letter um, with a plan that had been slowly gestating in my mind, I guess, uh, to do with what could be done about saving San Francisco's sea heritage. And instead of throwing it in the waste paper basket, the way most such letters wind up, Scott took it to the management of the paper and said it sounded like a good idea to him. Moreover, he would devote some of his energies and skills to making it happen. 
Chronicle reporter Dave Nelson was assigned full-time on the project, and he and Cortum soon became a team. Anyway, we got the building, and I got friends of mine to uh, volunteer, and we had regular volunteer work parties over a period of about a year, and we turned the building into a maritime museum, and it was enormously successful when he threw, threw open the doors in 1951. The public loved it. Everything was great, except there was no salary for the staff, and that was me and my wife, Jean, who would come to work there as a secretary. So I figured we had to get this ship, good old Balclutha, which you could see out the window across the bay at Sausalito, turn her from a wreck into a floating museum, do it thoroughly, do it well, and put her on display and charge admission and make some money. Anyway, she was a roaring success. I'd predicted she'd make $100,000 in the first year. She'd actually made 93000 and she's gone on to take in better than $5 million. And that's the money from this old square rigger that supported the San Francisco Maritime Museum for 23 years. Other opportunities to renovate historic ships presented themselves, so Cortum and his friends looked for new sources of revenue. So, through the lobbying efforts of many friends of the museum, Aquatic Park entered the state park system, and money was available to acquire the Hazlitt Warehouse, develop the empty lot between it and the museum into a Victorian park, and extend the Hyde Street cable car into the middle of the park, as well as create a display of floating monuments at Hyde Street Pier. But all was not completely well in the neighborhood. The old brick Fontana building, adjacent to Ghirardelli factories, was torn down by a developer. And he put up what my daughter, I think, aptly describes as the two ugly buck teeth in the otherwise beautiful face of San Francisco, the Fontana Apartments. The residents of Russian Hill band together and lobbied for and won a 40-foot height limitation along the waterfront. But Cortum had read about some motel interest in tearing down the Ghiardelli plant, and he'd gotten the idea that the buildings would make a good extension campus for the University of California. The grandson of Captain William Matson was Bill Roth, and Bill had recently been made a member of our Board of Trustees at the museum, and the governor had appointed him a regent of the University of California. So I went to see Bill, Dave Nelson and I went to see Bill Roth, and about six months later, one of the happiest telephone calls I ever received in all my life occurred in which Warren Lemon, his real estate chamberlain, got me on the phone and says, Bill Roth has decided to buy the Ghirardelli. Have you got any ideas what he can do with it? Coming from Sausalito every day, I saw this building uh, each morning uh, when I found that it was for sale and that it too probably would go into a high-rise uh, apartment, uh, I decided that perhaps something should be done. Meanwhile, let me say that uh, Carl Cordon at the Maritime Museum just down the hill had been instrumental in developing the aquatic park out here. Uh, and so, in, in a certain sense, there was a possibility of developing a total area that perhaps would have importance to the city. And finally, out of this came uh, slowly the idea of a mix, in the first instance, of retail stores and restaurants, but always as sort of the centerpiece, keeping this open interior space which was here uh, when, when it was a factory. Shortly after we had opened, uh, Mr. Martin at the, uh, did a rather similar thing at the cannery with, with great elegance. There was somewhat different in that all they had really was the sheath of the building, and then using a fine architect, Eschrick, they redid the internal space. I read that Bill Roth bought the old Ghirardelli chocolate factory and uh, their plans, his plans, were formulated and published 
and I admired those plants and I was somewhat envious of that brilliant idea to rejuvenate that area. Then it occurred to me that uh, I could do it also. I didn't have to look for an architect. I knew a good one already. His name is Joe Escherich. Once he was a sculptor or an apprentice to his uncle who was, who was a sculptor. The idea was to create corridors, <clears throat> narrow walkways, arches, staircases from which you see the rest of the building, the mingling crowds, to Jashrik. The crowds were part of the building. Well, after all the various architects had made their proposals, we decided to go with William Worcester. What you try to do is bring in the most modern, the most simple, functional architecture possible and meld that with the older buildings. And then I think you get something that is architecturally uh, legitimate, uh, and, and says something. It's amazing when we started 20 odd years ago that uh, people were very skeptical at that time. We had ups and downs. The cannery is somehow involved into a joyous, merry place. Very early on, we, we thought it was important to have some entertainment going on, and we had uh, street, street performers, including that uh, meme who late, later became very famous. The square and the aquatic park, and now the Hazlitt Warehouse, which is just down there, and the cannery beyond it. Uh, Sitting as this, as they do, right on the edge of the bay, uh, have I think brought an excitement to this part of the city. In building the cannery, I shouldn't forget to mention Margaret Larson. She designed the flags, the cannery flags, portrayed a symbol of the cannery, which is. Uh, reinforcing washer plate, the purpose of which was to reinforce the brick walls since the 1906 earthquake. And we felt that the design of that washer should be our symbol of our ability to survive. Joseph Conrad's square was the scene of what in retrospect is one of the more amusing battles in, in this neighborhood to preserve its quality. Leonard Martin of the cannery for many years paid rent to Southern Pacific against the day that it could be turned into a park. Park Otago, which was abandoned in Tasmania, and Carl Cortum wanted to rescue what was remained of it and bring it back to San Francisco. He felt that Conrad belonged in San Francisco since one of his characters in one of his stories, I think it was Lord Jim, mentioned Frisco. But somewhere along the line, Southern Pacific decided that it would uh, create a more lucrative operation on that little tiny site. And they leased it to developers who were proposing a 40 foot height building. The idea was to put the transom and this square, which is a triangle. And that came up before the planning commission. And, and with some ease, we defeated it because even then the planning for this area had located a park in that area. It, it's a beautiful park and a wonderful contribution to the city of San Francisco, and we owe it to Carl Cortum, 
Mayor Feinstein and of course Joseph Conrad. You can sit in their swivel chair, midst the city's rush and rumor, and fret o'er the cares of the world affairs and the woes of the poor consumer. But I don't envy such gilded ease. Just give me the salt, salt ocean breeze, the lift and surge of the white cap seas on the deck of a halibut school.